Now at 6, the First Lady and Secretary of State about to take center stage. Complete coverage of Night 2 from the Republican National Convention. Let's dig in a bit on Night 2. We are joined by KTLA 5's political analyst, political consultant, and analyst Matt Klink, and civil rights attorney and policy advisor Sonia Diaz. Welcome both to you. Matt, let's start off with you. Um, we've got Melania Trump on deck uh, tonight, Mom, Mike Pompeo. Uh, what are your thoughts about the controversy surrounding Mom, Mike Pompeo's uh, speech tonight? And what can we expect from Melania? Well, you know, Mike Pompeo would be the first sitting Secretary of State to speak uh, uh, at a convention in 75 years. Uh, but I think the fact that he's doing it uh, from Jerusalem, uh, that Trump made the official spot of the U.S. Embassy, uh, is very symbolic and meaningful, uh, not only because every president, Republican, and Democrat had pledged to do it, and Trump did it, because it's a it's a huge accomplishment for the Republicans, and they've been strong supporters of Israel. Uh, Melania Trump, she had a, a little bit of a snafu in 2016, where uh, long story, but she apparently borrowed some phrases from a Michelle Obama speech. Uh, so I think she's going to take a different tack this time. She has kept a decidedly low profile uh, on purpose. So uh, I think that the bar is relatively low, and they say she's going to speak from the heart. And let's hope that she does. Sonia, a chance for you to weigh in on the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issue. He's breaking, as we've said, with decades of diplomatic decorum. There's talk of him potentially running himself in 2024. He'll have the platform of the Trump base. He'll be speaking largely to evangelicals with a backdrop in Jerusalem. Is this speech for President Trump or is it for Mike Pompeo? Well, I think that the RNC convention is about making President Trump comfortable and ready for a campaign that is going to be arduous amidst his failed leadership around the coronavirus pandemic. Having the Secretary of State Pompeo participate in this unprecedented way comes a night after former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who also probably has eyes on 2024. So this is really interesting because it provides a foil of two foreign policy experts and leaders from the Republican Party who are making a play for the highest office in the land while being surrogates for President Trump amidst a time when America is not a friend of Europe and not a friend of uh, the, the Far East. And in fact, you know, with our handling of the coronavirus pandemic, our real only peer is Brazil. And that is not a place to be. So I think that this is fascinating. It is a competition. One may scratch their head as to why people are taking the stump, but I think that it's really about getting the nomination after the cycle. All right, Sonia Diaz and Matt Klink, thank you so much to our political analysts uh, for now. Of course, we're going to have more on the opening night of the RNC, excuse me, night two of the RNC on the news at 6.30. And so let's take a deeper dive into what we've already seen and what's still to come tonight during the convention. We are joined by our KTLA 5 panel of political analysts, political consultant Matt Klink and civil rights attorney and founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, Sonia Diaz. Thank you to you both. Matt, it's a big night for the First Lady, giving uh, what some are saying is the longest speech of her career. It clocks in somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 minutes. And the all-important appeal to women, an area where the president has a lot of ground to make up against Joe Biden, trailing double digits in the polls with women. What do you expect, Matt? Well, look, you know, Micah, she, she's taken a decidedly low profile uh, in the, the three and a half years that President Trump has been in the White House, largely on purpose. In fact, she's, she's garnered more attention for what she's wearing rather than what she has said. Uh, you know, so today, if she is indeed speaking for that long, uh, she must have a lot to say. And if she is, again, if she's talking for 24 minutes, let's hope that it is meaningful and that it does have a message that resonates you know, I think that uh, Donald Trump, uh, in 2016, he did well with married women uh, and with women in the suburbs. Both of those have fallen off, and there are weak points for him this election cycle. So if she can claw back some of that lost ground, 
I think that it will ultimately be a success for the president. Well, Sonia, uh, Melania has um, has said before in an interview that she has her own opinions. And uh, from what we're learning about this speech that Melania will give from the Rose Garden, um, that this speech has not been vetted by the West Wing, that it's all coming from the East Wing um, and uh, the White House. What are your thoughts about that? I'm really curious if Melania is going to buck the trends of this evening and actually identify the 178,000 Americans who have died because of the coronavirus pandemic. Our country leads the world in our death per capita, and it frankly has not been discussed. Tonight, instead, we've been seeing a lot of commentary around cultural grievances and canceled culture. And I'm not sure how any of those grievances translate into actual policies or governance, especially as we find ourselves in the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression. We find ourselves uh, no better off with the coronavirus pandemic in response. And we also find ourselves not only dealing with racial reckoning that has been made top of mind again with what happened in Wisconsin, but climate change. We see wildfires in California and other types of natural disasters, including hurricanes in the South. So I'm curious if Melania is going to discuss any of these things. Matt, we just aired moments ago uh, the speech given by the president's 26-year-old soft-spoken daughter, Tiffany Trump. She has remained largely out of the spotlight, in large part due to her study. She's a recent graduate of law school. Uh, she spoke again moments ago. Here's part of what she said. My father is the only person to challenge the establishment, the entrenched bureaucracy, big pharma and media monopolies to ensure that Americans' constitutional freedoms are upheld and that justice and truth prevail. My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred, because fighting for America is something he will sacrifice anything for. He dreams big dreams for our country, and he is relentless at achieving them. You see, Make America Great Again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right. Her speech four years ago was well received at the convention. How about tonight? Look, uh, Micah, as we talked last night, you know, the Republicans are not campaigning to people in California. They're not campaigning to people in New York. They are campaigning to people in the middle of the country. And she also said something that I think is importantly is very important and very relevant. You know, the Democrats want equal outcomes. The Republicans stand for equal opportunity. And she did hammer the mainstream media uh, for being largely unfair to the president. Uh, in fact, the media's popularity is incredibly low right now, and ironically enough, lower than President Trump's popularity. So uh, I think that she was catering to a certain market. Uh, that is not going to play well in Los Angeles, uh, but it, it will play well in other parts of the country. And again, what you're talking about, I mean, if we want change, it is rather ironic that the Democrats are talking about have a candidate that's been in Washington, D.C. for 47 years, and every single one of the major problems that exist today existed 47 years ago when Joe Biden was there. So if you want to enact change, uh, Joe Biden is not an agent of change. He is a part of the Washington, D.C. swamp culture. Okay, uh, Matt Klink and uh, Sonia Diaz, our analysts, we're going to get back with you in just a moment. We do want to tune in now to the Republican National Convention. Night two of the Republican National Convention just wrapped up moments ago. And we're once again joined by our KTLA 5 panel of political analysts, political consultant Matt Klink, and civil rights attorney and founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative, Sonia Diaz. Before we begin, um, we just want to play this one soundbite from uh, Melania's speech that was early on, uh, because, Sonia, we were talking earlier about how no one has really mentioned covid uh, 19, but uh, Melania Trump did address that at the be very beginning. Let's listen to what she said. I want to acknowledge the fact that since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one 
and my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. So Sonia, I think we'll start with you. Um, you, were, you were looking for that to, to be mentioned somewhere in the um, RNC and, and Melania did address it. What are your thoughts about how she handled that topic? Yeah, just exactly as I hypothesized, Melania, as the First Lady, was the only big voice tonight at the RNC to mention the coronavirus pandemic. With her mention of that, she also started to talk about the opioid epidemic and said it was invisible, that it knew no bounds based on race, ethnicity, or where someone lived. And I thought that that was going to be another segue to the coronavirus pandemic, because that is so often how this disease is being characterized, yet she shifted very quickly. And what I noticed tonight was that it's as though the RNC is making it seem like the coronavirus pandemic is past tense, that it's beyond us. And I want to make something really clear, which is that this is not just an election about the White House, but control over Congress. This is not a focus on the flyover states. This is a battle for Orange County, which up until 2018 was California's red curtain and the Republican Party lost to Democrats in 2018 midterms. This is also about important seats in Arizona, like the U.S. Senate seat, where Senate candidate Mark Kelly is trying to unseat the gubernatorial appointee who had lost to a Democrat, Kristen Sinema, in 2018. So I think that the RNC cares about control over Congress, cares about control over the U.S. Senate, Yet, I don't know that the messaging tonight is really appeasing those voters, particularly women voters. Uh, Matt Klink, the name Daniel Cameron is not a household name. After tonight, it may well be the Attorney General of the state of Kentucky. Here's a bit of what he said tonight. Mr. Vice President, look at me. I am black. We are not all the same, sir. I am not in chains. My mind is my own. And you can't tell me how to vote because of the color of my skin. You can hear the refrain, a star is born. No, absolutely. Uh, a lot of uh, hearkening back to uh, a young politician named Barack Obama in 2004 uh, when he spoke. Uh, you know, Daniel Cameron uh, is clearly a rising star. Uh, I believe he got the most votes statewide in Kentucky in the last election uh, and someone who has been mentioned uh, as a possible replacement for Mitch McConnell when he decides he doesn't want to run uh, for the United States Senate in Kentucky anymore. Uh, clearly a conservative African-American, extremely well-spoken, extremely smart, very quick, and he put Joe Biden in his place for some racially insensitive comments that the uh, vice president has a history of making that are frequently overlooked by the mainstream media. Uh, speaking of Mitch McConnell, let's talk about his absence um, here at the RNC. Um, we'll start with you, Sonia. I mean, I think this is really important and indicative of where the party is going. They are essentially caving to support Donald Trump and what the Trump administration and the Trump family want out of a convention versus focusing on down ballot, focusing on a platform. Again, the Republican National Committee voted unanimously to adopt the platform from 2016. One may say that that is efficient, yet our 2020 is completely different than where we were four years ago. We have people that are battling a public health crisis of global magnitude. We have unemployment at rates that are higher than ever seen in contemporary history. We see natural disasters and rising temperatures, including two of the worst wildfires in California history just this month. And all of that is absent. So one of the things that's important is we need not look further than the 2018 midterm elections where the Democratic Party wiped out Republicans in key traditionally red states. And that was a referendum on Donald Trump. That was the issue that voters went to the polls and they said, we want our health care. We don't want a tax on the Affordable Care Act. We want good jobs. So 2020 is going to be another opportunity for voters to have a referendum on Donald Trump. That doesn't make his colleagues in the Congress and also down ticket ballot um, colleagues for the party in a good position. Matt, uh, well, your, me, your response me, to that, no, to that uh, impression uh, sure. that essentially the Republicans are doubling down on the 2016 platform. 
Yeah, I'd offer a slightly different perspective than Sonia in the sense that uh, 2016 was a referendum on the uh, O'Biden and Obama, Obama eight years, and that resulted in Republicans taking both houses of Congress and winning the presidency. And 2020, uh, look, it, it, we had for the Democratic platform, what, there were a thousand Democratic delegates that voted against the Democratic Party platform. Party platforms are largely meaningless. But if that's the case, Bernie Sanders and the radical left played an instrumental role in crafting policies that Joe Biden skirted away from during the convention. So the bottom line here, Mitch McConnell, who will speak, I believe, tomorrow night or on Thursday, uh, Mitch McConnell will continue to be the majority leader of the United States Senate uh, in 2021. And the election will be fought on, you know, it's going to come down to the debates between what Donald Trump's vision of America is and what Joe Biden's vision of America is. And right now, neither of them have been particularly clear in what that uh, vision is, in part because both of them have some serious problems that they have to deal with. And that's what the debates will hopefully settle. Okay. Uh, to our analysts, we're going to take a quick break here and continue more of our coverage of night two of the Republican National Convention. Back in a moment. Back with our panel. Final thoughts. Matt Clink to you first. 20 seconds. Go. 20 seconds, uh, America was introduced to the rising star Daniel Cameron tonight uh, from Kentucky, current attorney general, someone who will clearly be going places, look for him either to be their next governor or the next uh, Republican United States Senator from, Senator from Kentucky. That's it. Over to you, Sonia. Yeah, lots of hypocrisy. We saw naturalization ceremony performed by Donald Trump as we see families and kids being separated at the borders. A ban on Muslims, public charge rules, and uh, undermining of the U.S. Census. We also saw identity politics from the Republican side as to why black voters need to support Donald Trump. And it is just very confusing, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. All right, Sonia Diaz, Matt Clank, thank you for your time. We'll see you back here tonight for the News at 10.